Hello, good people. We are gathered here on this Sunday afternoon to celebrate an incredible documentary about an incredible show started by a bunch of incredible people. Uh, before we get into things, I want us to, of course, pay respects to an incredible performer, Chadwick Boseman, who could have done the biopic for damn near everybody that was on the show, Soul, uh, and whose, whose contributions as a performer are magnified only by the fact that it has been revealed that he was creating so much of his great work during such a time of duress and stress due to his diagnosis. And so I just want to take a moment to acknowledge his loss and uh, send my love and light out to his family members and to all of us who were touched by his work and who feel his absence. Um, you know, I think it would be, I would be remiss to, to not acknowledge that we are in a great time of upheaval. Um, I call it an eruption of consciousness. Um, it's also one of, of awareness, one of struggle, one of release, all of these things at the same time. And what happens when all those things happen is things come to the surface. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of folks don't want to face those things that come to the surface. However, there are things that come to the surface that are oftentimes also blessings and light. And one of those things is this documentary, Soul. Mr. Soul. Um, Mr. Soul is a documentary, documentary film that won the 2018 Idea Award for Best Documentary. And it is chronicling a show that, um, that is, it is beyond my scope of reasoning why this show has not been immortalized to great, um, to, set to, to the extent that it deserves to up until this point. But I'm so happy that you all made this film because it chronicles the show Soul, which was started by producer Ellis Hayslip in 1968 on PBS. It was a performance variety show that gave stage, it gave the screen to such incredible uh, Black artistry that ranged from dance to poetry to conversations like between Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin to performance, to music of, of all different kinds from Tito Puente to Black Ivory. We had we had a stage for Black voices that wasn't just, you know, pundits. It was the poets that were speaking to, to what was going on in the nation at that time. The, the last poets, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, and more. And we had folks behind the camera, legends like Stan Lathan, who were partnering with Ellis to make this happen. And thankfully, we are now able to see the extent to which this, um, this show has has affected folks in a real way, because I think a lot of us don't even know how much it affected where we are today and our ability as performers and creatives to carry forth the work that was done on this show. And I wanna say that I'm so honored to be able to be here and be in conversation with the immense list of individuals who we have here um, that are gonna be joining us. And it is no great feat to have all of these individuals <laughs> in one place at one time. And I, I guess, you know, that's one of the few, um, I guess that's one of the few silver linings of this thing called COVID is that we could get everybody in one place at one time, which is very rare. But I wanna first uh, bring to the stage um, the producer, director, writer, and niece of Ellis Hayslip, Melissa Hayslip, whose work reflects social justice, elevating the voices of women and people of color, and who uh, put this together along with Mr. Blair Underwood, executive producer, and the voice of Ellis Hayslip and Mr. Soul. Come on up. Let's talk about this incredible documentary. And let's talk about this incredible person, Ellis, who had this vision and this show. I am embarrassed that I did not know about so I don't know you know this is when I feel like you see the man then did a great job of of hiding the things the work the contributions that um empower so many of us so thank you all for coming together and making this happen first just tell us you know what was soul the show I know I gave my my view but you guys put this documentary together so I'd love to hear your point of view Wow, thank you so much, Amanda. It means so much for us to have you here too and to be leading this wonderful conversation, this kickback today. Um, and can I just say, 
I was blown away when you posted on your Instagram last year a clip from the James Baldwin, Nikki Giovanni um, episode of Soul. And I was like, what? <laughs> And, and it that just was went crazy. reaction when I saw it. And I was like, how, when, where is this from? Um, and I was like, where is this from? And people were like, I don't know. No one knew. No one knew. And I did some more research. So in a way, it was special, though, because it really didn't matter where it was from, because it was about what they were saying. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about black love, black family, black sister and brotherhood, black literature, black artists. and that conversation is so current that you could be having that conversation today, you know, but in terms of what it was, was this was an episode of Soul, which was this amazing show on PBS from 1968 to 1973 that really showed the total black experience. And up until that point, that hadn't happened before, you know, to be unapologetically black, an undiluted show with all aspects and the complexity of black people, that was rich, you know, that was revolutionary. Blair, in your words. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say this first of all, Amanda, that was a beautiful preamble and a beautiful introduction and do not feel bad because I was not aware of soul myself. You know, part of it was because it was PBS initially, local in New York, and then it became national after that. Um, but a great many people are not aware and should be aware of this, of, of this show. And that's one of the reasons, that is the primary reason I wanted to be a part of this, uh, Melissa, who I give all credit to because she is, this was her baby. She gave birth to this, this baby, this documentary. She wrote it, directed, produced it. As you said, Ellis Hazlett, the host, um, is her uncle. So it's, it's personal. And my job as executive producer with her is to just support everything she's doing. So that's why I'm here. And I can't wait to hear this Zoom room full of folks that were the original artists that, that appeared on this show and can really speak to it just fervently. Well, yeah. and it's so cool. Go ahead. I'm just gonna say it was just really cool to be here today and to be sharing this virtually with, with folks because you know that's like how we get down right now and it's just important that we can connect and be a family and that we can lean into that and you know lean into healing around everything that's happening right now and I really feel like the arts are healing and Ellis Hazel knew that and, and it's uplifting to see so th that's the reason we're bringing the film out now it's like we want to to be uplifting and inspiring at a really dark time to say, hey, yo, we were already excellent. You know, we've been excellent. <laughs> um, black excellence is not a fad, you know, it's something that yeah. is real. That's why they keep trying to catch it. <laughs> uh, can you just tell us a little more about your uncle? I think a lot of folks joining us um, would just love to hear, especially since, you know, it's family. So there's a different connection there than for those of us who are just watching in the documentary. Yeah, it is family. And there is a beauty to that kind of relationship. He mentored me as a child and we, he taught me about being in the arts and he taught me so much just by allowing me to be near him. And then as I grew older, um, I got to work with him, which was really special. And I always felt like, oh, who, who is this magic guy that knows everybody? But what I was really touched by was that it was about relationships. He wasn't like clout chasing and it wasn't about celebrity or anything like that. It was just about the beauty, recognizing the beauty of these artists and wanting to push the culture forward. And that was one thing that, that was consistent about him. But as a family member, he was always there for us and he was always very quiet, but always making change, you know, and pushing change. That was really cool. How did you two, um, Blair, how did you get involved in the project? Melissa just reached out and said, would you be interested in narrating the project? And she sent me a trailer that she had put together. And I was absolutely blown away and almost kind of irritated. Kinda, not unlike what you said, said, I should know this. Everybody should know about this show. So I said, I couldn't, I couldn't, I think I called you right away. I couldn't get on fast enough. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do the narration. Would love to be honored to, but what else can I do just to help get behind you and give it a platform? And as you worked on the documentary and you learned more about the show, how, you know, how did it make you feel? Because I know I, I had like feelings watching the documentary. Well, extraordinarily, incredibly proud of who we were. Like Melissa just said, it was unabashedly, um, unapologetically black for us, by us. And, and, and that, was rare, that was rare then. And look, we don't have a show like that now. All the platforms we have, all the streaming services we have, we don't have something like that now, which we, we'll talk more about. 
I was going to say, I was like, can we bring this back and can I host it? Like what? <laughs> but, we, but we need it. But we need it. And again, I'm glad you both spoke in different ways, but just where we are right now and that beautiful tribute you gave to Chad, Chadwick Boseman uh, the other day and just now, you know, what I'm feeling, yeah, it's about what I felt. I feel anger. I feel frustration. I feel sadness um, with this, everything going on right now. But it is absolutely the artists throughout history who heal and project and, 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 and interpret what, what the society, what the streets are saying, what the community is saying. And that's what, that's what this show did then. And that's what our job is now as artists in this moment to do. And also, I think that Ellis Hazlip knew that Black joy was revolutionary, you know? And so carving out a space to be joyful and curating that joy, I think in curating the culture, he was also curating the joy. And so now when we're feeling all these, you know, we're just caught up in feeling uncertain and nervous about whether it's administration or COVID or our jobs, you know, the rent, that's all real stuff. And it's almost hard to say, you know, do I have permission to be joyful? And then you realize, wait a minute, Right. I, I have to be joyful. You know, that's been our survival since we came over from the shores of Africa. We've had to survive and we've had to be joyful. And so in a way, black joy is revolutionary and we need to cultivate that. And that's why the film is out now. Well, one of the people that was involved in cultivating this is uh, one of my favorite humans on the planet. Uh, I hope Sana knows that I have borrowed her father. He is now my father too. Uh, Stan Lathan. Um, Stan Lathan is a director extraordinaire who was a part of the show and directing the show for three seasons. Stan Lathan also directed my comedy special, Abby Nowen. Um, and so we would love to, to bring Stan in to join us in this little chat. Um, because I think, you know, Nikki actually, hi Stan. Y'all don't understand how much I love Stan. Stan know how much I love Stan. Everybody loves Stan. It's Stan. Um, we can't hear you though. I think you're muted. Stan muted. <laughs> no, you gotta do it on the Zoom. Marita, there you go. He's back. <laughs> you do that. I'm, I'm hitting at the. the uh... I see, I saw that hand. <laughs> <laughs> banging on the on the like, anyway, I, I do that often actually. So. Um, so Stan, so Nikki, uh, Nikki talked about in the documentary how when she had the conversation with James Baldwin, they had a different type of director because they were in London, and the director was like shooting their hands, and she said, you know, it would have been different had we done it in the states. So I wanted you to just talk about your experience directing Soul and just all the unique types of performances and how that affected, you know, your skill, your craft. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's funny because I, when I came, when I, when I would, got the job, I just moved to New York a, a few months before because I had been do, directing in, in Boston for a public television uh, station. Another, another African-American show called Say Brother, which was very similar not in, in form, but of course, you know, the folks that we brought in were local folks, local Boston folks. And every once in a while, we'd, we'd get a, you know, a, a name group in the two, and we'd record them. But we also did a lot of political stuff and social um, docs, documentaries and stuff like that. But anyway, at some point, I um, was hired to do, to come to New York and direct a show called Black Journal, direct and produce and um, they kind of came to Boston and looking for looking for you know black people with talent, and I and and soon after I got to New York, you know that was that was something that was well known that there was a hey there's a black guy over there directing Black Journal and and uh, John Stone from from Sesame Street said yeah we need a black guy so I, I I went in and did a few Sesame Streets and stuff and then finally I could then one day about a couple of months after I got into town maybe more than a couple of months actually, I got a call from, um, from, from Ellis Hazlip. And I said, oh shit, Ellis Hazlip. Is this another one of those calls? Because if it's Soul, I'm down. Because Soul was, you know, we knew, I knew what Soul was because I was in public television kind of um, network. 
and knew how great it was and how you know how and how we used to the other show that I did we used to like just wish we could get the kind of talent and so forth and to, to tell you the truth Alice Hayslip you know had a rep among you know black folks that were in the arts I mean especially in New York he was you know he he, he got around for a while so anyway he called I got I got to his office I finally got to his office. And um, I walked in and he said, Stan Latham, great to meet you. I want you to direct my show. I mean, it wasn't even an interview. It was a command. <laughs> so, and I said, you, I'm, I'm, I'm down once again. And so um, soon after we, I started directing for him, um, I mean, he started me immediately and he made it clear to me that we were, you know, what his, what his mission was. Um, and more importantly, he, he made it clear that, you know, that he was open for, for me to be as creative as possible. You know, I had, a, you know, I already had some directing skills and he, um, he inspired me to take it to and try to take his show to another level, which, and, you know, cr creatively, which is not that easy because it was a low budget show at, to, to begin with. And you know, it was a, bu a show with a low, a low budget and a short schedule, but still he had a way of kind of pushing for excellence uh, in the way in the way we developed the show and in the kind of things that we tried to do. He also was um, was very supportive at all times. You know, I never felt I never it, with the creative people around him. I never saw him really get get angry or, or or you know rant or anything like that. He was always when you see him do do interviews and you see him now. And I was reminded when I looked at at some of the um, some of the footage again. He's always he seems very kind, very calm and kind, and 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 um, he's always he's he's very he's very kind of intimate with folks that he talks to and the way he does it. And he does that with the, with his crews and he gets people to, um, to really give them their best to, within the crews and in, and in with the artists that come in. Um, and I felt, I felt like I was learning something about the art of producing um, from him. And um, he, he was really a mentor. I got to a point where after I was there for a while, he was actually pulling me to the side and saying things to me about the work and about the process that were that were teachings, you know. And he, and I felt like he had taken me on as a as a uh, as a pupil or as a a uh, mentee, if you will. So for me, the experience was really. Um, uh, it's probably a, the most important one I had while I was in New York for sure. Uh, and I did a lot of work in New York, but it was Ellis and Soul that really kind of woke me up about, you know, the the art of of the art of the of of being an artist and of and of have and of of uh, taking responsibility for the for the the stuff that I that I produce and direct and. And uh, I, I learned it from Ellis. And you know, the other thing is, I learned about how he 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 deals with talent. You know, he he was he was like a groupie. He like he he loved he loved music and musicians. He loved dancers and choreographers. Um, and I see him have a have you know really amazing conversations with folks like like. Um, uh, Lee Morgan and 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 Har Silver and 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 then this, he was have, he would have the same kind of relationship with 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 Sonia Sanchez and and and, and Nikki Giovanni and the Last Poets um, and Amiri Baraka and and I mean the the, the list goes on. Uh, or even uh, even Poogie from this from this you know from the uh, the the, uh, the Delphonics was like amazed at this cat. You know, so we, um, you know, we, it, for me, it was that all of that stuff was, was very important. And all, all of it had an influence on me. And, and later, uh, as I got into the business, moved around a little, a, a little bit, and I started running into folks that had played on the show, that had met on the show, 
um, all the entire group of, uh, of Earth, Wind and Fire, Stevie Wonder, I did work with him. And, and, and uh, all of them talked about their soul experience as if it was really um, kind of revelatory because they it was the first time they as artists went into a television studio and were, and were treated you know, with, with total respect and with total appreciation of their work and in, in, the, in their and their and they um and they say that that would that had an that that had an effect on on their work after that. So um, Alice was uh, was a monster. He was a uh, he was a beast, as they would say. Well, but uh, he he really got it done, and he really, you know, this mission that he had. I really believe that he was very successful at getting making the 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 the, the contribution that he wanted that he met, that he set out to for sure i don't know you know there's there's so many things i can so many so many stories i could tell that would that that would give you a, 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 an idea of how he worked but i think that the, the time thing is probably uh, sneaking up i saw a lot of people in this room <laughs> I'm like that, you know, um, you know, you, you just let Stan go, you know, you see no interruption. I'm just like, go for the Stan, go. Um, I, I want to bring in two women who uh, took part in this production. And I want to say we are joined by such an incredible uh, list of individuals today. And some will be staying, some will be dropping out. So I invite all of you all to uh, stay tuned and stay focused because you know, we got we got a lot coming for you. And we are about to bring on two icons uh, who need no introduction. So I will just make sure to say their names quickly so we have more time with them. Miss Nikki Giovanni and Miss Sonia Sanchez. Yes, yes. So I don't know if Nikki can make it, but Sonia here and Miss Sanchez, how are you doing on this lovely Sunday? Fine, how are you, my dear sister? It's so good seeing you and everyone, right? Yeah. Well, I am so happy to, to be able to moderate this conversation. And, um, you know, Stan, thank you for, for really just giving us a, just a point of entry into, ah, there she go. Hello, Ms. Giovanni. Um, so we were just talking to Stan about the, I can't even believe this this Zoom right here, but I'm gonna pretend like it's not happening. So uh, we were just talking to Stan about just the incredible work that was amassed at Seoul, but also just the energy that was created there. And he spoke about how the artists would come and there was a different type of interaction that happened at Seoul with not only their artistry and not only the audience, but also with Ellis. And so I wanted to speak to you all because I know, you know, as poets, as black women, you know, Sonia, you speak about in the video, in the documentary about how sexist the movement was at the time and how Ellis gave space for black women's voices. And so I would love to hear you all speak more to that and just the uniqueness of soul as a space for you all. Mm -hmm. Am I in? You are in, sister. Oh, machines hate me. I gotta say, and I just can't, <laughs> I have to say, you know, we were all in love with Blair. We thought he was the cutest thing in the world. <laughs> We were, we were like, oh my God, you have to get the it. Of it. He was the cutest thing. I don't know what happened to that brother. <laughs> oh, you, you still are, Blair. It no, was no. so, you know, Blair, it was so much fun. And meeting you and, and of course, Stan, I mean, it, uh, we, we loved it. But the person that I think I have not heard mentioned, who needs to be mentioned, is Novella Nelson. Mm. Novella had so much to do with the, Ellis was, was very, uh, as we all know, he always dressed beautifully. He looked good. He paid millions of dollars for his suits and things. But it was Novella that said, everybody on that stage has got to be treated as, as an actor, as an actress. And so we brought in, we're not we, but Ellis brought in a makeup person and brought in the dress person. And so for the first time on television, Black artists were treated like artists. And so did that. So made it a, 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 a special thing that you got there, you got your hair made up, you got your face made up, 
you had your clothes, you know, you, you handled yourself. And I think that that was, uh, 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 we were looking, we were talking about, you were talking about uh, the things that we learned from Ellis. But I think one of the things that the Black shows learned from Ellis so much was to treat the artists like artists, to treat them like, like individuals, to treat them like people. And Novella did that. We have to give Novella credit. We're so sorry. Of course, that, that that she's gone. She and Alice are sitting in heaven, drinking a, a glass of champagne or something. But we have to give Novella credit for making Ellis understand she was an actress. She was a Broadway actress, if you recall. And we have to give her credit for making Ellis to understand this is important. And we, we got Blair and Stan there. I think that they would agree with me. And if not, you know, they can share what they think. But I think that that was one of the important things that that Ellis did. Well, Stan, as a director, I imagine that's a part of the whole vision, no? Oh yeah, no. He was, you know, he was kind of a, a um, perfectionist in on, in many ways. But that was something that was that was definitely that we dealt with. And it, and once again, with a low budget and a tight schedule, it you know it, it, it could get kind of uh, dicey with with if there were more than a couple of women because we couldn't afford too many. Uh, makeup and, and hair and hair people. However, we got it done. We got it done, and everybody felt good good about themselves for sure. Sonia, how does it feel talking about soul? Well, in talking about soul in the current climate that we're at, do you feel like a show like Soul can even exist in this in this space? Probably not. I mean, not with what uh, was happening. You know, Soul was what I. I think you would call um, a cultural university, you know, when, you know, when, as we try to move to begin later on Black Studies, that was a cultural university that we saw there, right? And also it was a cultural spa. You know, we didn't get, we didn't go to spas, you know, we couldn't afford that, but it was a spa because it also rejuvenated us. Every night that show came on, you can be assured that we were sitting down watching that show, not moving, because we knew that we would see ourselves that, you know, it, it kept us from being so weary from the battles that we fought, you know, from the confrontations, from the deaths that, um, and, 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 and the dying that we did during that time. People forget the dying also that we did at that particular time. Um, uh, so here we were, this show uh, gave us um, that culture that we needed to keep going, to keep moving, to keep saying simply that, look, you, you, you're looking at some beautiful people and some human beings and the baddest people on the planet earth. Like we have taught you so much and here you are uh, finally allowing us to come on. And I remember uh, uh, seeing if Nick, Sister Nikki, if you remember those six Black women who were poets on that stage. No one had ever seen six Black women, you know, looking good, fine, <laughs> all dressed up and spouting that poetry that says, shut up. You, you know who I is. You know, you're dealing with a bad sister here. And, you know, and we looked at each other and we smiled at each other and we, our hearts went out to each other because we knew not only were we bad, but we were helping someone else be bad in the universe at the same time. Um, we, by the way, that's still going. Uh, you're still helping us be bad in the universe at the same time. Um, because the work that you all did on that show and the work you all have done beyond, it just resonates in a way where I, I mean, I, I hear you because shit is crazy. Um, <laughs> but it's imperative that we find a way to, in my opinion, I feel like it's imperative we find a way to carry forth the work that you all did at that time. It, because we are in a different time, but it's the same shit. So... <laughs> There to me, we are the result of the work you all did. And so if we were to stop that, then I feel like we're doing you all a disservice. We're doing Ellis a disservice. We're doing Soul a disservice. We're doing all that dying a disservice. You know, it's already a Pyrrhic victory to many, many reasons. But I um, I just want, because I, because I get to, I just want to face to face with you, uh, just say that the work you all have done is, it's alchemy. You know, it's alchemy. It is. Um... You know, what, wouldn't you be happy? And I'm a fan of hers. 
But wouldn't you be happy to see Joy Reid take that next step? Because she's got read out. And so I wonder, you know, what would happen if we could get MSNBC to go read in and have a show like Soul to have Joy coming in and bringing these people on. What she needs is the music because she's doing too much po uh, politics. Well, I actually would host it. But uh, it be I would actually like to host it. Yeah. Uh, no. As a, as a, as a, yeah. Because uh, <laughs> the politics is the politics, but we need artists with the artists. And, the artists. Um, and uh, so I, 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 I would, I, I would literally like, I already made calls by the way. Um, so just so you know, Melissa, um, but you know, Listen, because I feel like you are the legacy of soul, Amanda, because of everything you're doing and all the platforms that you have and pushing forward the culture and all the voices that you bring on. I mean, you are the legacy of soul for real. I, I'm honored to hear you say that. I, I think, um, I think we're in a time where we're seeing, and I, you know, you all are giving your your flowers all the time, and so I, you know, I feel like it's imperative that we continue to do so. But I know there's a lot of people that are feeling very worn, very um, exhausted by just the the amount of negativity, the amount of idiocy, the amount of um, death and dying that we are seeing. And so there is a balance that is needed, and you know, social media and memes don't necessarily pack the punch of the work that you all were doing on Soul, where we get to see art in a real concentrated, undistilled form. And so I wanted to hear more just from you guys about what did you feel as artists when you were, when you came in contact with this show and you got to come on the show, like, do you even remember like how you decided what you were going to perform? How did that process go with, El with Ellis? Was it like he had seen you perform something and he was going to tell you this, is what you're going to do? Or did you all brainstorm? How did that go? I like the James Baldwin conversation with you, Nikki. How did that go? Well, you know, I met with Ellis, uh, Melissa, you may or may not. I met with Ellis once a week. He came up to, I, I lived on Amsterdam Avenue. My next door neighbor was Morgan Freeman. And Ellis came up once a week and we discussed what would the next show be? And we know that Ellis was gay. And one of the things that frightened Ellis was that some of the other people would be misogynistic and wouldn't come on the show. And so I was always saying, Ellis, they'll come, they'll come. And so he wanted and, and got, actually, he really wanted Farrakhan to be on the show. I said, ask him. He said, he'll say no. I said, that's all he can say. All he can tell you is no. So let's let's go for it. Let's see if he can do it. Of course, Farrakhan was delighted to come on the show. And of course, Muhammad Ali came on the show. He And, and I think that one of the things I did was to help him just keep asking, just keep asking. And I, I, at the end of the year, the second year, which is how I got to talk to Jimmy, Ellis said, I owe you. And I said, yes, you do. <laughs> and he said, what, what do you want? I said, I want to talk to James Baldwin. And he said, well, I know Jimmy. And that's how we got the James Baldwin show. Why did you want to talk to James? Because he's brilliant. Are you kidding? Because he's absolutely brilliant. And I thought, boy, as a young writer, if there's any one writer I could talk to, and I think now, if she were still here, a young, uh, let's, let's say a young writer, for example, like Renee Watson, who I, I just adore. I think it's just a wonderful young writer. If she could say, who could I talk to? She would say Toni Morrison. But, but you know, Toni is not, not with us anymore. But the novelist, you know, you, you want to go to the best people. And Jimmy is one of the best people. So I was very lucky. Jimmy was busy. And he said to Ellis, I don't have time to come to the United States. Will she come to London? And I said, tell him I would swim to London <laughs> to be able to talk to him, which is how we got the show. <laughs> I absolutely was, was delighted to, to go and to talk to him. I and mean, that was, I think, one of the important things because Jimmy hadn't talked to somebody my age. He was used to talking to people his own age. So our conversation, I haven't listened to it again, but I know some of the, 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 the parts that happened was we were discussing men and women. And who do, what lie do you tell? And I was I pointing mean. out, I was pointing out, you know, don't, don't lie to your boss and come home and be angry with me. Lie to him and come home and love me. I'm the one standing there trying to love you. And so we had, and that just went, Jimmy just went, you know, cause nobody had ever reminded him. We women were home trying to make a home, trying to show that you are loved. My new book, by the way, is called Standing in the Need of Prayer. 
and the cover has a, a, a policeman shooting at the back of Trayvon Martin. And it's, it's kind of time that, that, and it's dedicated to all the mothers. It's time that we got into that. Don't, 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 don't clean up what we know to have been, a, 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 what we know to be a problem. Don't keep shooting black men in the back. So I keep saying to the black men that I know, if you're going to be shot, turn around and make him shoot you in the chest. Because he's just so cowardly. He doesn't, the cops don't, you think about it. They haven't shot anybody in the front. They shoot you in the back because they're scared. They're cowardly. And let's and say, Amanda, so, yeah. Amanda, you had just posted that uh, like a couple of weeks ago, the clip from that episode yeah. where James Brown was talking about what, what was going to happen if, if, if he was stopped by a cop. And that, that clip went viral too. And people were talking about it like it was today, even though it was from a conversation you had yeah. Nikki, in 1971. Yeah. Because now is not new. It's just how we're gonna deal <laughs> oh, with it. Great line. Oh, the poets are gonna steal that one, Amanda. <laughs> now is not new. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a poet myself. Nikki, I, perf I had the honor of performing uh, as a, opening for you at, at Texas A&M University in 2005. Oh, um, and I remember you had your Thug Life tattoo and I was like. <laughs> I have it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, poetry, I, I, I had a life in poetry. I have since become a stand-up comedian. Um, but I would love to bring on um, two individuals who have lives in music and who gave us a soundtrack to this incredible documentary. Layla Hathaway and Robert Glasper. Robert could also be a comedian as well if this whole piano thing doesn't work out. Um, but uh, <laughs> Glasper, unmute your mic. Yes. Yeah, because I'm so awesome. Hello? <laughs> what up, Rod G? What's up? <laughs> hey, yo. So I'm not sure, is 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 Nikki frozen on anybody else's Zoom or is it just- I think she's mine? frozen on yeah. mine too, yeah. Okay. I can hear her, but I can't see her. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we are we are joined by Robert Glasper, Grammy, Grammy winning Robert Glasper and Layla Hathaway, individuals who uh, have collaborated several times and who find themselves as collaborative efforts in creating the music behind this, uh, this incredible documentary, Mr. Soul. So Glasper, Indeed. like, Tell me, where, where do, I mean, there's so many places that you pulled from, but just tell us, where did you pull from to, to create the score? Uh, I pulled from my household when I was in elementary school. Uh, <laughs> my, my mom was a sing. she passed away, but my, my mom was a singer um, and she sang in all kinds of different clubs, jazz clubs, R&B, um, you know, country, was the music director at church on Sundays. She was sister act in real life, like, you know, so, uh, so much music in the house. You didn't know what you were gonna hear when you walk in the house day to day, you know what I mean? So all this, when it, when Melissa approached me about doing the score, I was like, Psh, that's that's the crib, that's easy, you know? So it, 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 was, it was an honor to do it. And it was just, it was just so uh, effortless, honestly, to do. And it just, it felt right, so. I mean, Layla, your father, Donny Hathaway performed on yes. Soul. He performed The Ghetto live hey. on Soul April 23rd, 1970, to be exact. Um, yeah. So how does it feel, you know, you bring, bring your vocal talents and his DNA? Yeah, uh, it's so awesome that, you know, like Daddy opens that movie, the sound of his voice opens that movie, and it's, it's so perfect, you know, and the fact that we are that I'm singing at the end of the movie that we book in this story is just so beautiful to me. And um, just, that's one of the only actual video performances of his that I've seen like ever. So I was honored, I'm just so glad. I didn't work on any other part of the score, but to, to work on that song with Rob and uh, another really talented writer named Muhammad Ayers, really great song and just really sort of exemplified the feel of that movie. Stan, when you were doing the music performances, like, did you differentiate like, okay, this, this is how we do music performances. This is how we do dance performances. This is how we do poetry performances. Like, how did that inspiration come as a director? I don't think we differentiated that much. I mean, once again, we tried to do 
uh, we tried to do different things from from week to week, but we were we were kind of saddled with a a schedule that you know that that was you know show up on Saturday morning with the with the and start lighting start put it start putting the set together, bring in the the equipment around about you know twelve or one. And then the, the group around about two, and then you have a you know it's more of a sound check than a rehearsal, and then we break for lunch around four, and you know it's that kind of thing. Next thing, next time you're there, you're shooting. So we, um, you know, I I I I kind of mapped out what I wanted to do because I was familiar with the with the with the words and then and the in the music, but um, it was pretty much, it was pretty kind of. Uh, improvised almost. I mean, we were, you know, and, and we got good at it. So after a while, we just, um, we just went with the flow. And the, uh, once again, the, 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 the artists were happy. I mean, because they got to, to, to you know, just kind of let it go. And uh, a lot of times they would just do whole sets. They would be, be on stage for 40 minutes. Um, and that like was- Like Stevie Wonder? The Stevie Wonder Show you directed? Oh, the Stevie yeah. Wonder Show. He was on stage for for an hour and a half, uh, and and uh, it was amazing. But let me tell you one thing real quick that that is that is tragic about the, about the the show. When we when we shot Lee Morgan uh, and, um, and 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 Horace Silver, uh, they, they both did real long sets, like a half hour each. And then, uh, but by the time we got on, on, on the, on, got actually in the show, and the show was was put together, they their their sets were like you know five or six minutes each. Um, and um, three or three or four weeks later, Lee Morgan was 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 killed, wow. shot in, in slugs, and um, a and well, I mean, Ella said, listen. We got to do a special tribute to him. We got we got his set. We should we should play it again, and we should um, you know build do do some things around it. Uh, and uh, we went back to 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 get that material, and we're told, "What do you mean? This shit's erased." We ha we have to recycle those tapes. We found out that many of the performances there's so much soul that never. Saw the light of day after after they were after they were shot. So much wow. you wouldn't be a you would be you would be, you know, really shocked to know that there's a lot a lot a lot of great material that never made it out of it. And there's, wow. there's there's episodes that they can't find for some reason. So when you talk about you know the history and and all of the the amazing stuff that, that should be here for 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 eternity, it's gone. I hate to drop that on you, but it's a fact. No, it's true. And Questlove has been trying to find it forever. He's like a catalog. He has like a card catalog of all the episodes. He's been like traveling all over Europe trying to collect. Of course. That doesn't surprise me. Of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> course he does. <laughs> I was like, he started telling me things I didn't know. I'm like, wait a minute, hang on. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, I got it all. You know, he's he like, has he everything. Has yeah. <laughs> well, we have also got, well, since, uh, I mean, it's unfortunate, that is actually like, that is incredibly tragic that there's so many lost performances, but we, we do have a performance, uh, well, folks that did perform that can still be here, Black Ivory, Russell, P did, I'm not sure if Russell made it on, but we got Stuart Bascom and Leroy Burgess and Russell Patterson from Black Ivory joining us to, um, to speak on their performances. Where'd they go? There they are. Oh. And they are featured. They are featured in the in the documentary. And I think it's so dope just seeing you all talk about how young you were. <laughs> Hearing you all yeah, talk about just, how young you were at the time you were on Soul. Yeah, we were. How you doing? It's a pleasure to be doing? here with everybody. Hey Russ, I see you down there. <laughs> yeah, we were 17 years old um, at the time. And it was a it was a great honor uh, to do the show, and, uh, and and a very exciting experience also. So, Leroy, when um when you and in the documentary you talk about you know 
how you guys wanted to perform. And I've been talking to Stan about just like how as a director he was envisioning and how he had to work with so little, but because there was so little to work with, you guys as performers, you had to come up, you know, you had to come with your game face on. And so I wanted to just hear you all talk a little more about like at 17, what it was that made you get your act together and how you all were able to, to come on stage so tight. Leroy, you're, you're muted. I'm not muted. Russell is not muted, but Leroy Russell is. Russell is not muted. And how's that, better? Yes. <laughs> oh, OK. Well, what I was saying was I was scared to death. It was crazy for me. Um, I was 17 years old. We were, I was surprised that the record was the kind of hit that, that we weren't, I wasn't expecting it. So when we were called to do so, I remember being a nervous wreck. Um, but uh, I think it was um, one of the, one of the, uh, I think one of the sisters just said, they treated us so well. They, they took care of us so well and they made us feel special. So I know that that went a long way to helping me relax, helping me feel comfortable, and and attempting to give uh, a a really good performance. But um, I was a nervous wreck. I often was, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it was great because uh, and so was our very first uh, television appearance, if I remember correctly. Uh, that was our very first time on TV, uh, and we were excited. I, I remember. My family went out of their minds when I was <laughs> when we were on. It was so cool, and um, Alice was the first person to actually give us that opportunity to uh, present our wares uh, and 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 our work uh, and share it with a large audience. So it there was nothing that wasn't cool about that. What did you say, Russell? <laughs> he'll go on and on and on. <laughs> Just let Russell, where are you? You know, I totally lost track of time. So I pulled my car over. I'm sitting in the park on the ground, got my headlights on so y'all can see. Hey. And it's getting dark about yeah, a minute. Baby. But I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, this is, this is the scene. Um, well, Rapper, can you tell me about y'all's outfit? Cause y'all had oh. some outfits, baby. Can you tell us about the look? <laughs> um, well, you know, our whole thing was, I, I decided at the beginning that I thought that since the name is Black Ivory that our look should always be black and white. You know, I had to kind of convince them a little bit cause you know, they like colors and stuff. But um, we found, we saw um, another act performing at the Apollo that had the uniforms and we totally fell in love with them so we found out who made them and it was this these two guys in Brooklyn called Black Opposite Two. So of course the name was perfect for us. So we went there and and they asked us what we were looking for and each of us got to design our own outfits and we got to be on soul. They messed mine up. They messed mine up. <laughs> you messed yours up. You my, to mine didn't come out right. Uh, uh, yeah, because you wanted to be a superhero. Yeah, I want. I was trying to be a superhero. It so was not a superhero. It was like this guy. <laughs> so, so um, you know, but but it was cool because when we started wearing the House of Black Opposites two outfits, it became a trend, kind of for everybody. The stair step started wearing them. The Delphonics. The Delphonics. Yeah, they everybody Kuna gang. Kuna gang. This was the place to go for and and we were like the second group to actually start wearing their clothes. Um well actually I think think we were the first group. Um the first person I saw us uh wear it was uh oh, Hank Fan. Right, it was um yeah Hank Fan, the DJ Hank from Fan. um uh, WWRL. Uh, yes. All right. Well, from black but we were the first group actually. Didn't didn't the well, black opposite two uniforms to dashikis all day every day. We <laughs> got to bring up the last poets, Umar Ben Asin and Abi Odun Oyewole. And you know, are they there? I don't know. 
that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, Abby Adun and uh, Umar Ben Asin are the last poets. You know, the last poets performed on Soul. And in the documentary, you know, y'all talk about what the track listing was um, and just the unique space that Soul had created for you all to, to, to perform, um, you know, in the, in the most, and we have Felipe Luciano with us as well. Uh, you know, there was such a unique space for you all to perform without being censored, without being uh, told to do like the watered down version. You can't water down uh, niggas are scared of revolution. Like there's no like <laughs> homies are scared of revolution. It doesn't have the same uh, ring to it. So I would love for you all to speak to just why that space was necessary. And, you know, not just for you all, but for others who were, who had messaging like yours that needed to be as raw as it was. Well, the fact is that the last poets, well, we started in 1968. And the idea of the group came from a brother named David Nelson, who is now a black Hebrew, uh, as he calls himself David. And the idea was that we would bring men from different walks of life together in a group because poets, generally speaking, are very solo. They don't hang out with groups. But we're going to try to bring a, a, a group of individuals together to point out the fact that we needed to have unity amongst our people. No matter if you're a Christian and Muslim or you're atheist, whatever it is, we got the same foot on our necks and we have to address it from a unified position. So that the idea of the last poets coming together was an idea of giving an example to black folks as to how much we needed to have unity. And then we, and of course, when you put any anybody in a group, you're talking about different personalities, different characters. And each of us is a poem unto ourselves. And that poetry that represented who we were individually became stuff we put on paper and shared it. And because we were all connected with the people, we were an instant hit from the very first time we went on stage. People just they related to what we were doing. And it was primarily, mm -hmm. and I always look at it from the point of view that we didn't try to talk above or beyond the people. We, we tried to speak directly the language of the people. And we kept it on that level. And when people say that we are the progenitors of hip hop, I'll say one, I'll say this, we took the idea of poetry and put brass knuckles on our fists and punch you in the face. Because before us, poetry was rather soft, it was rather quiet. The only person that was really dealing with poetry from a loud position was Amiri Baraka. And he had a group in New York, New Jersey uh, called the Spirit House Movers and Players. But everybody else was basically having poetry readings in little tea rooms and you eat trumpets and you sip tea and, and you all kinds of lovely quiet things. We made it a rowdy sound. We gave it a, rev a revolutionary flavor. And that was the other point. And then the other thing is that we also had a place called the East Wind. A lot of people know about the East in Brooklyn, but before there was an the East, there was an the East Wind in Harlem between Fifth mm -hmm. Avenue and Madison Avenue. And there we had groups like Sunrise Orchestra, Dawn and Albert Isla. I mean, we had major talents come through there. Leon Thomas and Pharrell Saunders major talents, uh, Rufus Harley, who played jazz bagpipes. I mean, it was amazing. Sorry, wait, 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 say what? <laughs> jazz bagpipes? Uh, bag, bagpipes happen to be an African instrument. And a lot of folks don't realize that. It's skin and wood. Anything made with skin and wood is an African instrument for the most part. Rufus Harley was a monster on bagpipes. And I, I, I guess he's on a, on your gadget, but he's the guy, uh, Rufus Harley. And, and we had all of the kinds of people like Terry Kaya. We had a number of fabulous folks, uh, Lynn Chandler, come through the East Wind, Eric Gale. We had phenomenal talents and we performed and we had workshops. Felipe Gable had a workshop at the East Wind after the kids would be at City College all day studying political science They'd come to the East Wind and there'd be about 50 or 60 strong and they'd listen to Felipe break down the philosophies 
of socialism, of capitalism, of, of communism. And he was good and captivating. So we had workshops. I did poetry workshops. And then, of course, out of the, our space came the National Black Theater. But just knowing Ellis was a very elegant brother. He had a lot of class. I mean, there's no question about it. He had his ways. You know, people were talking about being gay, whatever. I mean, that's, that, whatever that's your thing is your thing. But he didn't let that get in the way of his humanity. He did not let that get in the way of his strength as a Black person with an understanding that we had to help each other in every possible way. And that we needed to exalt our culture, put it on display, let the world know that we know the diamonds that we have to share. And that's what he did. Soul was like a black diamond. And it's a gem that needs to be treasured forever because it captured the essence of who we really are as a people, politically and musically. We speak through our music, always have. And to be a part of soul, to be asked to be on soul at that time, because I was young too, like the brothers in Black Ivory talking about how young they were. Well, I was like 19 years old, I was a kid as well, and I was learning, and I wanted to be in the Black Power Movement. And the last post was my avenue into the Black Power Movement, even though it kind of scared me because I hadn't read all the books that many of the people I was listening to had read, but I learned how to, I learned quickly. I mean, I had brothers that I was hanging out with quoting pages from, uh, destruction of the Black Civilization and Crisis of the Negro Intellectual and Moon Two and all this. So it was a learning process to be a to be a part of the movement. And so was an example of how we could put this on display and show the world exactly how bad we be. And Felipe, you brought, you know, you melded the world of you know Black American culture, but also you brought Afro Latino culture into the mix. So can you speak to um, you know, your connection with Ellis and bringing Tito Puente to the stage. You're on mute. Felipe, you're on mute. You're on mute, Felipe. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, the genius of Ellis Hazlip was that he was able to unify uh, and put under one banner blackness. It was Latinos were a, a, an entity but we really didn't have a profile. And when I went to him and suggested that we do a, a, uh, a Latino show, he didn't even hesitate, didn't even hesitate. He said, of course, let's do it. And he said, you do it. The trust that he had in me to do that, I already had envisioned it in my mind. Thank God Stan Lathan was there because what he was able to do with that small space, he's right, there was very little money, there was very little um, a space, but he put together a club. It was a club atmosphere. And Tito Puente hit it so hard. And so did Willie Colon and so did Hector Lavoe, who's now an icon in our culture. There are several things I'd like to say about Ellis. First of all, Ellis was an intellectual. He graduated from Harvard, uh, Howard in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. He was a middle-class person and made no bones about it. He was gay and made no point, and made no, there were no qualms about it. You either accepted him or you didn't accept him. And I loved him for that. He also was able to confront myths, myths about sexuality, myths about who was black and who wasn't. He was able to do that. The, the shows that I remember that were most poignant to me were the shows with the Reverend Louis Farrakhan, the shows with um, uh, Rassan Roland Kirk, and the shows with Amir Baraka, where they discussed homosexuality on the air. And he was able to, con I mean, he was clear about it. He never got bold. He never, as Stan says, he never uh, over overstepped his boundaries, but he was able to confront them with what the myths were as opposed to the reality. We did the show. It was called Shades of Soul. It's still considered in the Puerto Rican community considered, it's considered one of the premier shows because we weren't on TV. People saw Desi Arnaz. They thought that was what, what that, that's who Latinos <laughs> were. Um, I had just come out of uh, the last poets, I was in the last poets, which led me to the formation of a group called the Young Lords. Now, to this day, we are trying to establish a profile. Ellis knew immediately that the, the, the uh, cutting edge of revolution is always culture. And that we can get into being mad and being uh, righteously indignant, which I think we should, but culture is the way to build a revolutionary consciousness. Amiri used to say, let your palms be bullets. And that's what we did. 
Seoul did that in a very insidious way. It didn't come out and say you've got to revolt, but it did say you should understand who you are in time and place, in space and time. And I loved him for that. He never shied away from confrontation. And the mark of an intellectual is that he's able to take abstraction and turn it into something palatable. He was able to do that with young people. He was able to do that with older people. He was fabulous for that. What, what happened is that when they took him off, and this is what really, it drives me crazy. I don't know how it is that we, we are as patient as we are. We have seen, and Nikki Giovanni mentioned, we have seen black men shot in the streets, shot, bo I mean, right in the back. And we have not revolted. We've not done anything. Our elected officials, our ministers have become punks. They have not stood up and said what we did in Washington, D.C. yesterday is commendable, but we need millions of people out on the streets. In Puerto Rico, we had a governor after uh, Hurricane Maria that was so ridiculous and so corrupt. Puerto Ricans, a million strong, came out and drove him out of office. We need the same thing done with Trump. Folks, we have to understand that at this point, we are facing the demise, the death of democracy. This is an experiment. Right. And Ellis knew that. He knew that the, this is fragile. It could go any time. And I wish he were here today because we'd be on the show talking about the destruction piece by piece, brick by brick of the United States, what we call democracy. And we can't take that lightly anymore. I'm sitting here. Sometimes I don't sleep. I can't believe it. They shot a brother seven times in the back. Seven times. And we stood there and watched it. And we watched also Mr. Floyd with the uh, uh, knee on his neck. And we're sitting here discussing it as if it's not, it's not normal. But this jerk that we have in the White House, this ignoramus, this racist, has us believing the banality of evil has become normal for us. And what Ellis used to do is say, and he, he knew me about this, I was, I was revolutionary, I still am, and I believe that you can kill a revolution, you can't kill a revolution. Ellis's history, his legacy, is that we, the black, black seed keeps on growing. We must remember, keep the culture going. Keep it going. And remember that the culture is diasporic. It's Cuban, it's Puerto Rican, though many Puerto Ricans don't want to be black. It's Dominican, and more Dominicans are beginning to come <laughs> over to the black hand side. It is Paraguayan, it is um, Honduran. Right now, as we're discussing this stuff that's happening in this United States, we're not understanding that Brazil is going to hell, that Mexico is going to hell, Guatemala, Honduras, um, I mean, all of it, Panama. We're, and what they're trying to do to Cuba and to um, Nicaragua is unconscionable. So all I'm saying is that Ellis was able to take all of this information and allow it to become black. I love the fact that he gave me the opportunity to do Latin music. And I believe that the real fear of this country, and I'm gonna say this as a statement, a political statement, the real fear is not only black people. The real fear is these Latinos who are coming up and they're coming by the thousands, by the millions. 18,000 new Mexicans are born every year. You know they're scared. It's bad enough they have to deal with black folk, but now they got to deal with people who are black and speak another language. We've got an incredible job to do. It is our job to begin to build the new souls, the new programs on TV, podcasts. What bothers me is that just in this conversation we're having, we're not looking at each other. We're looking at each other through the lens of an iPhone or a computer. We need to, the, the unity that we had was based on intimacy. We hugged each other, we, we uh, kissed each other. Um, we told each other, hey, man, how you doing? This isolation from this new technology is going to kill us. And either we understand that and begin to come together. I don't care if we have to come together with face masks. I would have loved to have done this in a studio with face masks six feet apart so that we can see each other. I see my brother Abiel Dun. I see uh, Umar Ben Hassan. I see uh, Sonia, who I've loved for 50 years, along with Jane Cortez and so many others. We have you not. Know, Umar, you know, Umar wasn't leave Michigan. Wasn't going to leave Michigan even if we didn't have to wear masks. He don't never no, leave. No, no. Let me tell you something. Uh, uh, <laughs> Man, we would. I would have gone over there and dragged his ass over here. Um, that's what we got to do. Umar's the kind of person you have to. You have to prove it to him 15 times and then drag his ass over to where you got to go. Uh, he's wait, a warrior. Wait, we got to hear from Umar now. Umar, what do you got to say about that? You're you muted. You're on mute, Umar. There Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Can y'all yeah. hear me? First of all, I would like to say Ellis Hanslip was one of the most fabulous, intelligent human beings that you ever wanted to meet. You know, because, see, I grew up in the street from eight years old until 16. There were all kinds of people I had to deal with. 
And the only, as long as you acted like you were a human being and you treated each other with respect, you know, we we didn't we didn't label you. We just thought you were one of the best persons around. Now you had the niggas who wanted to try to take you out and steal from you. We knew them, but Ellis, you know, he was just another human being to me as far as I'm concerned. And Ellis, you could not be too black with Ellis. He didn't like you coming and think he was all black because Ellis would play with you for a minute. You, I'll show you how black you are, motherfucker. You think you're black? I'll show you something. So Ellis was cool with me. I liked Ellis. But now Jalal, Jalal, he kind of had a problem with us because see, Jalal had this big afro. And the two times that we were on the show, Ellis made sure that he come over and put his hands through Jalal's afro. And you can see the, <laughs> Jalal's face when that was happening. It was crazy. But listen, man, we were glad that he even gave us the opportunity to be on that show. So like I say, he was one fabulous human being, man. And you couldn't play games with Ellis because he probably knew most of the games that were being played. And I was, if we, we, we like being with really. it. I like being on Ellis and y'all. I mean, I remember the first time he brought me on show, he said, come on, come here, let me talk to you. He said, I've heard about you. He said, you got, they say there's some things with you that I said, just be cool, we're gonna get along. I said, I'm cool, I was, I'm cool with you, we gonna do this, let's just, you know. But I was glad he called me out. Because he just let me know. I know your mom. I heard about you. So be cool. And see, in that poem, Niggas Scared of Revolution, that poem was so good because it was written by a real nigga, me at the time. At 19 years old, I went into my blackness or to millennials. <laughs> I was still a nigga out the street. So that's where every little function or every little thing I talked about here, I knew all about because I had experience because I was following. But, um, you know, becoming one of the last poets, was one of my uh, best thing that could happen to me at my age of 19 and 20, because I had a lot of talent. And the thing, how it happened was I was in Ohio and I had come out of the streets, I was into my black thing now and I was poor. And there was a um, show at this um, college in uh, uh, Ohio and Doom was in the last poets were on the show with Doom, Garland Kane and somebody else. And so I was pretty, <laughs> they said, well, Ma, you know, you're gonna be head of, uh, you're gonna be head of security. We're gonna put you at the door. So, so I'm at the door, and Doom comes up, and you know, everybody knows Abby Doom. He can be garbage, and he can mm, mm, he can bogarts if you want to. But so he comes up. I'm saying, listen, man, you gotta check in and check out. I said, man, I'm not checking. You know, you ain't checking me. And that's Abby Doom. That's who he is. I'm not letting you check me. So I said, listen, brother, you either check in or you're checking out. So listen, man, I told you, I'm not being, I'm not being checked in. So I pulled up my jacket and I had a 38 pistol under there. So I either told him, you check in or you check out, baby boy. You know, he looked in, it's okay, I'm going there, we're gonna check in. But then we got up on stage and so he said, who's that crazy nigga y'all got out there at the door? Who is that? So I said, well, that's my Ben Hassan, you know, he's one of them. But being, coming a last sport and hanging out with Abdul doing and even meeting Philippe and Guy Lee and Kane and all of us, I think that it became a great thing for me. It slowed me down and made me funk function and further and use my so-called madness to, you know, write some things that touched other black people who knew what I was saying and who could feel what I was saying. And that helped me out a lot. And then, you know, to be in the presence of Dune and Felipe and Galen Kane and David Nelson and now Don Babatunde, who is our drummer, it has really, I've become much better. What Dune will tell you, I have grown up a whole lot because he's seen me at at the beginning, he know who I am now, but Ellis, Ellis and that show was a big part of me helping to grow up. And I hope to help a whole lot of people feel about that. But that was a very important show uh, so. And Ellis was a very important human being to- Amanda, Amanda, may I say something? Yes. Hello? Um, Amanda, what we forget uh, with all of this um, praise of Ellis and his intellect and his artistic wisdom is how funny he was. He was hilarious. There were times in the office where we got no work done. We'd be on the floor laughing, pissing on ourselves because he would say that he made love to the Dalai Lama. I mean, he, uh, he made love to Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> he made love to Princess Margaret. I said, Ellis, you bullshit. He said, I'm serious. I know <laughs> I, I did. And we fall on the floor. Now, his niece says he has an incredible um, ability to stretch the truth. Um, but he had us almost believing it. He was funny as hell. 
and we would uh, we would actually lose hours because we recount stories and he'd ask us what we did in our lives and 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 he would have a story about each person he had um Anna Maria Horsford who now is a star of TV um was there Loretta Green was there the people that we had it was just a wonderful show and Ellis was able to bring all of those elements together in a mm. way that was a functioning unit it's hard to do television Amanda it's hard it's not I easy know. You know, I've, I've done these things and I'm, I've been, I was a reporter for many years and I'm telling you, just getting a newscast on was a miracle. He got but a Ellis, show but, on but, every but Ellis, week. But Ellis made it look easy when you came on there because you know, I know about being on television, but any little thing that he looked like you didn't understood or you wasn't cutting into, he'd come and talk to you, pull your side and help you. He made it easy for you to be yes, on the did. show to accept that. What was going on because you know, there was a bunch of little ex young people from this street and that world, and we on national TV now. There were things that there were some fears there, there was some, you know. See, that's such an important things. thing to say. That's really important because that that willingness to mentor and create space for that is so uh lacking. And like I know, like in working with Stan on my special, on my comedy special, Stan didn't just direct my comedy special, like Stan mentored me. Like I yeah. went through that process and I really didn't know what I was doing. Like I knew, okay, I, I'm funny. I know I'm gonna figure this out. But, you know, Stan, you know, was a teacher. And oftentimes it just feels like when we get in these spaces, especially as black folks, we didn't get the process time that, that other folks got to. So we gotta be perfect when we get there. We may not have mm. the information. We might not have the experience. So Ellis being a teacher in that space, Stan at this point, you continuing to be that like that's something I aspire to be as well and I try to be you know we all have to mentor each other and I and hearing that Ellis had that element along with the class along with the uh the relationships along with the vision just speaks to how important this show soul was as not just an, an hour of programming every week but as edutainment you know and that's what all of you all were doing in your music in that time and in your in your art and your creations and that's what people like Robert Glasper and I continue to do now. And that's what Blair and Melissa are doing by recreating this documentary and putting it out there. So I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight and today. Glasper, yes? I just got something from Melissa real quick. Yeah, what you got, what you got? Be right back. <laughs> in the meantime, in between time, Melissa, where can people check out Mr. Soul? Yes, yes, Mr. Soul is streaming. Right now, it's a virtual uh, premiere that we're having right now. We're partnering with um, cinemas all over the country that have a virtual platform. So if you go to our website, www.mrsoulmovie.com, and you go to the screenings page, you'll see a list of over 70 theaters across the country. And you can click on any of those theaters, or, a, or maybe it's a museum or a cinema organization that's partnering with us, like Studio Museum of Harlem has one coming up. Schomburg has one coming up. Next you question. can click on any one of those, and you and can just watch theaters. the show, buy your tickets. But but, uh, uh, Melissa, Melissa, thank you so listen, much. Listen, I'd like to say something to uh, Melissa and Blair. Listen, thank both of you for bringing yeah. this back together and for giving it some more I space. knew it was going to be right. I know. <laughs> we know who you are, Melissa, but um, we know who you are, Melissa. We know that you're going to make this work again. But then to bring Blair along with his class and style just adds another part to the beauty of this. So thank both of you for doing this. The class and style. Welcome, Common. Robert. What's up? I'm just saying what's up to all y'all great ones up here. Stan. What? I'll be with what's going on? Blair, what's happening? Oh, what's, up? Man, what's up, baby? Hey, hey, Common, oh, you, oh, hey, Common, you were incredible. Common, what are you John doing? Too. I Thank just you, think man. Common is an, he's an incredible actor. Did you see him in John Wick too? Hell yeah, he was yeah. incredible. He was mean. No, he can't. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, man. Common, <laughs> man, it's so good to see you. Common, we got to get you on the soundtrack, yo. Right. You. I'm gonna stay in front of all these people. We gotta get you on the soundtrack comment. Come on now, come through the soundtrack now. <laughs> oh, it's the last poem. It's one of the reasons I do my thing, man. Thank y'all, brothers. You know, y'all came through on the corners too. I love you. I love to be on the soundtrack. We'll do some stuff. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we're gonna figure it out. For sure. Let's do it. Yeah, I wanted to see you on, on Broadway, man. I mean, yeah, see you Amanda on, the I'm hosting every night. Amanda's the hosting. Stan, Mr. You're the Soul. Greatest. Stan, you know you're the greatest. 
<laughs> you know what I love about you know what I love about it all is that it's definitively black. Yeah. Ellis never That's lost it. that. He never That's lost it. his being blackness. This is important for me as a black Puerto Rican to be grounded in blackness and in a southern male who understood class and Elan mm. and didn't allow the class to keep him from understanding the poor people, understanding people who were disenfranchised. That to Thank me you. is the mark of genius. And yeah. so Thank I you. give credit to Ellis Hayslip for having yeah. kept me black. And so I can transmit that blackness to my community, Puerto Ricans, uh, and increasingly Dominicans and Mexicans and several others who are here. I give him credit. Black consciousness is now, it's at a point where we have to now bring that to the world. And it's true. The beginning of revolution is culture and soul is at the spear tip of it. Keep it oh. black, keep it black. That's thank you all so much for joining night. us. Um, I just want to also thank Stan who wasn't gonna stay, but stayed the whole time. Ah, um, <laughs> And I just appreciate all of you all and the work that you have done and that you continue to do. You can check out Mr. Soul as Melissa Hayslip. You can go to MrSoul.com, Mr. Soul Movie. Mm -hmm. Mr. Soul Movie.com and you can check out, there's at least 70 theaters and different organizations that are gonna be able to offer you streaming. So you know what, we're inside, we're alone, we're alone together and we can experience this show that so many of us should know about that me and Blair just found out about. Um, and. <laughs> And that really, Mr. at this point in time, Mr. Amanda, I would like to thank you for bringing such class and style to this presentation too. Yes, thank you, thank you, baby girl. All right, you know, you know something, you know something. I think I'm going to move to LA when I see Robert Glasper and Common and all these people out there. I'm saying I better do something. I better get out there and bring something to it. We are here, man. we are here, <laughs> we are here, and just know, like. The, you know, the, the show, everything that you're saying, those of y'all who are joining us and watching this, I, you know, I don't mince words and I don't, you know, talk out my ass when I tell you like this documentary will invigorate you. It will revitalize you. And I think a lot of us right now are in a great need for something to, you know, just give us a little extra punch, a little extra boost to that next day and that next moment and that next creative idea that's going to help us synthesize a way out of this. So. Thank you all so much for putting this show together. Thank you all so much for being involved in this and Thanks continue so much. doing the great work you've done. Have a good night, Thank you. Thank you. God bless. God bless. God bless. God bless. That was beautiful. Right.